deadly pandemic. Going back to school. There's a lot at stake here. It's something we all want, but can it be done safely? How in the world are you gonna control this behavior? Tonight, fears, facts, and answers. You're packing 300 kids into a school. How is that following the guidelines? We'll hear from teachers. I think they're so disconnected from reality. Balancing risk and responsibility. It's in the public health interest of K-12s to get back to school. Parents who need to get back to work. I'm spread so thin. The risk of her not having access to education outweighs the other risks and students whose education is about to include one of the biggest lessons of their lives. It just goes to show that anything can change our lives. This is an NBC News special report. <clears throat> Coronavirus and the classroom. Hello everyone, I'm Lester Holt and thank you for joining us. There may be no greater example of how the coronavirus pandemic has disrupted American life, how it has sown chaos and anxiety along with illness and death and the challenge of going back to school. Tonight with the new school year upon us, families, communities and educational institutions across the country are facing a bewildering array of tough choices and it seems none of those choices are without risk. Teachers want to teach, but can they do so safely in person in a classroom full of students? Parents want their kids in school, but will that put those kids in harm's way? And how can parents go back to work if their kids have to stay at home? And what about the kids themselves? Millions of students from kindergarten to college eager to learn, to get out of the house, to be with their friends. Is that an acceptable risk or a disaster waiting to happen? Over the next hour, we hope to bring some clarity to those questions, to bring you the very latest information to help you understand the stakes and navigate the choices your family will have to make. We have our team assembled to take us through it all, and we'll hear as well from the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. Robert Redfield, on coronavirus in the classroom. And let me just quickly get this out of the way right now. I am separated by more than eight feet from the nearest person behind a TV camera, and thus I am not wearing my mask right now. Well, let's get started now. NBC's Tom Costello on where things stand right now. Tom? Same story with me. Thank you, Lester. Nationwide, 90 kids and teens have now died from COVID-19. But public health experts generally agree they need to get, we need to get kids back to school. It's better for their education. It's better for their physical and their emotional well-being. But if kids return to school in a COVID hot zone, the fear is that the virus will spread like wildfire, endangering entire communities. Across the country, the morning ritual is changing profoundly for 56 million K through 12 students this school year. For those who return to school in the fall, fewer kids on the school bus, face masks, temperature checks at the front door, fewer kids per classroom, alternating in-class days, and spaced out cafeteria seating. I think he's able to go to school, interact, you know, have the teacher be his teacher, not his mom be his teacher. But for millions of kids and teens, the return to school this fall will be virtual. Of the 25 biggest districts in the country, 18 are opening with remote learning only, including L.A., San Diego, San Francisco, Seattle, Denver, Chicago, Houston, Atlanta, and Washington, D.C. Other school systems, including New York City, the country's largest, plan to use in-person learning or a hybrid model. Still, a quarter of New York City kids are opting for all remote learning. No one wants it to be this way. Parents, educators, and students would all love to be back in the classroom. I miss school and my friends and going to different places. But these are not normal times. There's a lot at stake here. There's a lot at stake for kids' educations and their social well-being, and there's a lot at stake for health. And finding that path in the middle is where communities are struggling right now. First, a fact check. Can kids contract COVID-19? The CDC says absolutely. More than 380,000 teens and kids have already contracted the virus, roughly 9% of all coronavirus cases. While most won't become seriously ill, researchers believe even asymptomatic young people can actively spread the virus to others, including teachers, parents, and the elderly. In Cherokee County, Georgia, two high schools are closed after dozens of confirmed cases, 
more than 1,200 students and staff quarantined district-wide. 45 minutes away, North Paulding High School remains closed with 35 positive cases after students packed the hallways, often without masks. I just feel like that's the risk some of us seniors are willing to take to have our senior year. Across the country, teachers are concerned about their own health. You're packing 300 kids, almost 300 kids into a school. How is that following the guidelines that everyone has put out? Marcy Warner is retiring after 40 years teaching in Scottsdale, Arizona. I love those kids and, and where I taught and what I did, but I'm not quite willing to die for them. But the president is still pushing to get students back. All schools should be making plans to resume in-person classes as soon as possible. Providing guidelines similar to the advice offered by health experts. The CDC is pushing in-person learning when possible. Among its many recommendations, no entry into a school for anyone with a temperature over 100.4. Keep small pods of teachers and students together all day. Physical barriers to minimize the transmission if somebody coughs, sneezes, or talks. In addition, continuously disinfect high-touch services like playgrounds, like doorknobs, light switches, desktops, countertops, and restrooms. Harvard's Dr. Ashish Jha says schools will need to prioritize which kids return to school first. The best evidence is that younger kids transmit less and also the best evidence is that younger kids really need that face to face in a way that the older kids maybe needed a little less. So if I were prioritizing, I'd start with K through five. In Houston County, Georgia, school resumed last week. Many kids kept their masks on, stood separated in the hall and sat divided by plexiglass at their desks. Now it's also reporting positive cases. I'm looking forward to seeing my friends and just getting back in the school. But that will have to wait for 10-year-old Asaya Giles in Maryland, who will start fifth grade online. Corona Care graduate, our first graduate of the year. She completed fourth grade at home in what her dad dubbed Corona Care Academy. You survive distance learning at home with mom and dad. You must be like at the top of your class. You are super smart. I am. See? <laughs> <laughs> Her dad, Tamba, was also at home, serving as the cook, reading, writing, arithmetic, gym, and music teacher. But he was only home because in his real job, he is a teacher at another school. Now teaching music online, which requires a lot of patience and flexibility. I told some of my students, hey, let's, let's do the lesson on a Saturday. I was okay with you know, extending the time, traditional times of Monday through Friday, understanding that my goal is, can I meet the needs of that child? No doubt about it, the 2021 school year is going to be very different. There's no way to eliminate the risk. You can reduce it quite a lot. You can reduce it for the teachers and administrators. And um, we, we've seen from other places around the world is when you do that, schools are not a source of outbreaks and it is generally a manageable risk. Dr. Sharfstein, Dr. Jaw, Dr. Fauci all believe that kids who are right now in low COVID exposure areas, they should be able to, re to resume to school without much of a problem. But in areas that right now are hot zones and with how quickly this virus is spreading, it's also entirely possible some kids will be online all year. Buster. Yeah, I love the Corona Academy. All right, Tom, thanks very much. No group has a greater stake in safely reopening schools than teachers in New York, here in New York, once the country's biggest hotspot, but now relatively under control. Some teachers are concerned about the city's plan to reopen its 1,800 schools for a mix of in-person and remote classes. NBC News and QB correspondent Antonia Hilton spoke with some of them. Shut it down. Jello has taught special education students in New York City for seven years. Black schools matter. He's used to challenging environments, but returning to the classroom in the midst of a pandemic doesn't sit right. I'm pissed off. I think they're so disconnected from reality. What are your personal fears about what it would mean for you to be back in a school building with your kids? My personal fear is that one of my students would get it and that they would die. Like that's, that's the absolute worst case scenario or somebody would contract it and spread it to their families. New York City leaders announced public schools would return to a mix of in-person and remote instruction now that the city's infection rates are under control. 
Alex is a member of a small social justice caucus within the larger United Federation of Teachers Union called the Movement of Rank and File Educators, and they're considering calling for a strike or sick out. The city consulted closely with union leadership on reopening plans, but some teachers felt like their voices weren't being heard Shut it down. by city leaders like school's chancellor, Richard Carranza. What I have heard from parents is that um, they need their children in school. So of the 1.1 million students in New York City, we have a little over 300,000 families that have elected to start the school year remote learning. That's three quarters of our families that as of right now are saying we will go to a blended learning environment as long as it's safe. How will the city respond if teachers decide to strike? You know, I don't know, but I'm appealing to teachers to say to them, we hear you, we understand this is based on the medical science and we set thresholds that if that number starts creeping the other way, we will pivot to remote learning without hesitation. I'm just appealing to teachers to understand that our children need us. They need us now more than ever. And some of them feel as though rank and file educators weren't brought to the table in the negotiations around reopening. Why weren't regular educators included in those conversations? Well, we, we've, I've had a number of, of town halls where there have been teachers that have been part of those town halls, but I do know that uh, the UFT, which represents teachers, has been working with us uh, shoulder to shoulder. I've been a teacher as well. These are scary times for all of us. Vanessa Costco plans to return to teach English at her high school in Brooklyn. She loves her students, but she's worried about her family. I would be putting my mom at risk of COVID. She has high blood pressure, she's undocumented, so she has no health insurance. And if she were to get sick, I don't know if she would want to go to a hospital because of her status. Do you think there's a chance you'd strike? I don't think so. To what extent does your family depend on you being able to work? A lot, because I'm the one that's helping with rent right now. Look, it's mommy. Alex has a two-year-old daughter, Miriam. His ex-partner, Gabby, is also a teacher. Yeah. And they don't know how they'll juggle childcare this fall. We all came into this with the idea that we want to do this job to service our children, to do our best. In good times, it's frustrating. But in times like this, it's even, it's, it's terrifying. That was Antonia Hilton reporting. Earlier today, I spoke with the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. Robert Redfield, who had a dire warning this week about what the fall season could bring. We talked about recent cases where kids have gone back to school and classes reopened, only to have those kids end up in quarantine just days later. I asked him what message that sends to other schools still on the fence about what to do. Well, I think the most important thing, Lester, is to realize that schools aren't, they're not only central to the child's academic success, but they really are important to provide the mental, nutritional, emotional support to children and their families. And this is why we believe it's in the public health interest of K-12s to get back to school. The most important thing to impact what you just said about kids being found to be COVID positive in school is to is to continue to get control of the transmission within the community. Again, many of these children obviously got infected in the community setting. So this is going to be one of the challenges to make sure we continue to make progress on community transmission in the communities that open and to really look, uh, it's in the best interest of our society uh, to work towards face-to-face -to -face learning. And in schools in communities that are still wrestling with an outbreak, should they be feeling pressure from the CDC and the White House right now to open classrooms or do you give them the space to make that decision? Yeah, we don't want to pressure anybody. Our guidance is there to help them begin to open, as I said, safely and sensibly. The timing of that is going to have to be decided one school at a time. We're there to help provide that technical assistance. You, I think, alarmed a lot of people with your assessment of what the fall could bring. We've got the flu season coming up here very soon. You and I both know that even without COVID, schools can be petri dishes sometimes. Walk me through what we might expect, not only in schools, but elsewhere. You know, thank you, Lester. I think it's really important at the emphasis that I'm trying to make that I personally believe that the American public 
is uh, taking heed to the messages that we said of the powerful weapons we have, universal face masks, distancing, washing hands, and being smart about crowds. And we do that, that we're going to have a significant impact on COVID, and we're going to have a significant impact on flu. But I want the parents to realize this is time to embrace the flu vaccine with confidence. Normally, only about 50% of the American public take advantage of the flu vaccine. That if we choose not to get vaccinated, not to embrace these mitigation strategies, it could be a very difficult time. But I don't believe that's what's going to happen. I believe the American people are going to embrace these strategies and as a consequence, and get vaccinated for flu. And we're going to get through, united, this pandemic and flu season together. And I'm optimistic, uh, cautiously, that sometime in the late fall, early winter, we'll have an additional uh, help, which will be uh, the beginning of having a safe and efficacious COVID-19 vaccine that we can begin to apply to help counter this pandemic. Well, you have seen probably the same pictures that we have been sharing every weekend, it seems. We end up with these pictures of mass gatherings, people not wearing masks, ignoring those rules. If that continues, flip this upside down. What are we looking at? Well, what I'd like to do is see how we can get the counter story out there too, where we do see uh, universal mask. I think that's why I said uh, it was a tale of two cities, you know, between whether we have two pandemics occurring at the same time or whether we're able to use these tools to mitigate them. I'm still going to stay and put my confidence with the American public uh, that they're going to embrace flu vaccine. They're going to embrace these mitigation steps. We are seeing a change in the number of jurisdictions now that have a, uh, an upward trajectory. And as you know, uh, parents right now, they, they just really want some guidance. They want somebody in authority with the knowledge to say, it's okay to send your child back. It's going to be okay, or maybe it's not. What do you say to folks watching right now who really need to hear from you or someone like you? Well, I think it's an important thing. We have tried to put out checklists for parents, as you know, that we've recently put out uh, to help them make that decision. We are going to be putting out additional um, reference material to help based on the amount of transmission in different areas. I think it's important for people to realize this is a process. Not everybody has to run at the same pace. Uh, we have to rebuild the confidence, obviously, of students, parents, and teachers. Clearly, those areas that are having limited transmission, what we call the green zones, are great places to start. Obviously, in red zones, one has to be more cautious. But I don't want to pontificate that, yes, you have to open if you're green, and no, you can't open with your red. I think we have to take each of these situations and evaluate them for their unique circumstances. You made the pitch, of course, for a flu vaccine. The anti-vaccine movement is alive and well in this country, and they've come at odds with schools over requirements. Are you worried about an acceptance of a vaccine in schools? Yes, and this is why I really call on my colleagues. Uh, I'm a physician by training. I call on physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, nurses, the medical community to invest the time it doesn't help to ridicule a parent that's nervous about vaccines. We're all nervous about making a mistake for the health of our children or grandchildren. Now, take time to work with those individuals so that they can understand whether they should be nervous if they're leaving this vaccine on the shelf. They want their grandchildren and their children to benefit from it. The same for the people that have been misinformed. There's a lot of people that have misinformed. You can't uh, change their view by just telling them you need to change your view. I don't agree with you. No, it's going to take time and dialogue to move individuals from what I call vaccine hesitancy from either fear or misinformation to bring them into what I'm trying to coin vaccine with confidence. I need basically my medical community to go all in on this and I need those individuals that understand the value of this important most powerful scientific gift to modern medicine, vaccination, to embrace that vaccine. Don't leave it on the shelf for their children, themselves, their community, and their family. All right. Well, Dr. Redfield, we appreciate you taking some time. It's always good to speak to you, and uh, we appreciate the update. Hopefully, we, we can do it again at some point. Right. I hope so. Thank you very much. God bless you. 
We'll take a quick break here, but we have much more ahead. We'll go on campus to Michigan State to see how colleges are coping and what this means for the college football season. And we'll have a bit of perspective from some of the kids at the center of all this in their own words. I am concerned that if I do catch coronavirus and bring it back to my family and it'll spread, I'm concerned about that, but it's very unlikely for it to happen if I stay cautious and clear. And I found the father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. When you need brutal honesty. This isn't about Donald Trump. This is about 400 years of racism. When you need answers first thing in the morning. What needs to be done to make ballots ready to go for the presidential election in November? When you need to go deep inside the story. What? So I convinced them to let me go to school. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. My parents are a little bit worried. They don't really want me going to school. They'd rather have me doing remote learning. But since I'm about to be in a high school, I kind of want to experience it. So I convinced them to let me go to school. For some students, going back into the classroom is not a choice. With so many students attending classes remotely this fall, many families across the country are navigating uncharted territory. Parents already struggling to make ends meet must now juggle work and having their kids at home all day. Senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule has been looking at that. Stephanie, good evening. Good evening, Lester. So many families were living paycheck to paycheck even before COVID. And because so many schools will be virtual this fall, some parents are forced to make impossible choices to keep paying the bills and also keep their kids' education on track. There you go. Nice. The Mullen family started 2020 on shaky ground. We were really thinking, literally, where are we going to live if we cannot continue to pay our bills? But things began looking up this spring when Chris, an Air Force combat veteran who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, finally landed a steady job with an irrigation company. 
They were climbing out of debt, but COVID had other plans. And we cannot necessarily make the choice that one of us is going to have to leave our jobs to be able to help with our son during the day. Their six-year-old, Britton, must start first grade remotely at his home in Texas. Mom Aubrey is struggling to juggle parenting and work. I feel like I'm spread so thin. While she has one child at home, many others rely on her at the Texas clinic where she's a pediatric nurse. It's a role where you have to use your heart, but it also causes such confliction. Should I give that much? Because the one that suffers in the end is our little boy. The Mullins say 85% of their income goes to bills. They fear the cost of childcare and say if either has to stay at home to facilitate at-home learning for their young son, they won't be able to survive. We've honestly strived to uh, cut what we we can. Cable internet, our Gr insurance, mm -hmm. our, our groceries, even our health insurance. Now millions of parents nationwide are in the same boat. In an NBC News survey, 45% of families say they've had to reevaluate their budget due to at-home learning. Six in 10 say they or a spouse have had to change their work hours. And four in 10 say their financial stability has been affected. A lot of folks that I've spoken to refer to this as it's just utter chaos. Are there parents out there who are deciding between caring for their children in person or being able to work and afford to feed their children? I think particularly of the single parents who have to hold both roles. They're the primary caregiver to their children and they're the primary breadwinner. Coming down. Like Latasha Kendrick, a New Jersey single mom of a six, seven and 11 year old. What is the number one thing on your mind right now? Finances, my children. Kendrick says she's overcome years of hardship, but if her kids have to learn at home, it will destroy all her progress. I'm gonna quit, I have to. You wouldn't be able to collect unemployment. How scary is this time for you financially? It's really scary. They're gonna need a roof over their head, food on the table. I have to figure it out. Kendrick says she earns just over minimum wage. She gets some assistance, but says two thirds go straight to essential bills. I wanna have hope, but I feel, I fear. So when you hear people say, oh, well, there's tons of jobs out there, but people would rather stay at home. I don't want to stay at home. But if I have to for the sake of my kids, I will. Parents across the country facing unbearable choices as their children's education hangs in the balance. We just are trying to rationalize how we're going to survive. We know that we cannot afford to stay home like many other families. The Mullins are still figuring out what to do. One option is to send their young son across the state to family who can help facilitate online learning. But Lester, no parent wants to send their child away. In Latasha's case, her school district still hasn't given a final answer on whether her kids will be back at school or at home. It's very difficult. Lester? Yeah, a lot of families will find that story very familiar. All right, Stephanie, thank you. As we've seen, there's no one solution to reopening schools. Some have opened their doors, some remain virtual, and others are trying a mix of both. NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn paid a visit to a New York school district where in-person classes have already begun, precautions are in place, and the future is unknown. Lester, I'm here in front of Pleasantville High School. It's just outside of New York City. This district serves about 1,700 students, kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. I got a chance to go inside to show you what they're doing to protect students and teachers. It could be a preview of what's coming to a school near you. Good job, what do you say to dad? Bye. Bye. Drop off Bye. is Hi, different. Hello. Good. 96.4. Temperature checks and parents filling out a health questionnaire each morning. Thank you so much. Is your child exhibiting any sort of symptoms uh, COVID related? Um, does he had a fever? Added safety measures to get back to school. Good morning, Leia. Important to Karen Dunlap and her daughter, Leia. For us, the risk of her not having access to education outweighed the other risks. The kids in this extended summer program are special needs students. Let's pick another color. And as we saw, the face-to-face -face contact creates valuable learning moments. Sometimes I speak Spanish. You speak Spanish? Yeah, I do. Hola. Como estas? Bien, gracias. Espanol, bien. That's fantastic. I love math. Math is my favorite subject. And then 
English too, and global, not so much, because I don't like history and stuff. Hi, Vicki, so welcome. We are entering into what is our K-1 and 2 space at our high school. Mary Fox Alter is the superintendent of the program. Pleasantville School District. Our cameras were allowed inside only after students left for the day. One of the big concerns is indoor air quality. What are you doing to address that? We installed state-of-the-art AHUs, air handling units. So we have this wonderful system to bring in as much fresh air as possible and to remove the air in the classroom. From socially distanced desks in each classroom to sanitizer stations, the school also ordered portable sinks to help with hand washing. And after five months, custodians finally received these 360 cleaning machines that disinfect classrooms. Fox Alter says the district prepared to reopen under three scenarios. All students back in person, a hybrid schedule with some at-home learning, and remote learning for all students. How did you plan for all the scenarios you could face in the fall? I have a district committee. Mm -hmm. We've asked for volunteers from the medical community, teachers, parents. Feedback is critically important to the work that we're doing right now. I sat down with a group of teachers for a candid conversation about returning to school. Were any of you anxious about coming back to school? I wouldn't say anxious. We all kind of put our heads together with all of the information that was out there and we came up with a plan. Really right now that's the most important thing is making sure everyone is safe and healthy. What were some of the biggest challenges in making sure your classroom was ready and that your lesson plans would be ready? I think it was the lesson plans we were able to do, but it was more executing it that was the challenge because you know we're very one-on-one, -on -one, hands-on. We do a lot of physical prompting with kids to redirect them. We often are very close with them, so we had to change our approach a little bit. Michelle, I see you're wearing a shield. Tell me about that. We're teaching kids letter sounds and how to read and start blending sounds together, and my mouth and my facial expressions are really important. What should kids and parents expect if they are lucky enough to come back to school in the fall? Wearing their masks, washing their hands, developing a strong awareness of their body and where they are in the proximity of other people. It's all uncharted water, so it's just being ready for that and always kind of knowing at any moment it could change. Mm -hmm. As for the cost of all these changes, the district is dipping into savings created when all the schools closed early last year. Plus, they've set aside 20% of each department's budget for a COVID-19 fund. Lester? All right, Vicki Wynn, thank you. Let's bring in our panel of experts now to get into some of these issues. Joining us are family therapist, Dr. Sue Varma, NBC News medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres, and Dr. Erwin Redlener, a pediatrician and founding director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University. is also an NBC News and MSNBC public health analyst. We've got some viewer parent questions we're gonna to get to, but Dr. Redlener, if I can just start off with you, I think one of the things that frustrates people is, is this is a moving target. We feel like we're all playing amateur epidemiologists with this thing. And so I'm, I'm curious, do you think we have enough information at hand right now to really make informed choices in this area? Yeah, it's a very good question, Lester. In fact, I'm very concerned that we don't have enough information, nor do the experts have enough information. It's not just that the parents that are struggling, we're all struggling with this, and it's all personal, but it's also a matter of public policy. We're about to do a massive national experiment involving about 55 or 56 million children who will be going back to some form of either remote learning or a hybrid version or back in classrooms. And I, I think we have a lot to worry about and be concerned about and maybe we're moving too quickly to get children back into schools. Many schools, for example, won't have the ventilation systems in place that they'll need, uh, even though they may be practicing the hand washing and the uh, distancing and all of that. We have a lot of concerns, including me personally, with four grandchildren in the New York City public health system, public school systems, and there's a lot for parents to be concerned about and try to process. All right, well, let's get some of the questions that were submitted by the adults. Dr. Torres, this question comes from Thais. Uh, Thais writes, I'm a parent of a 15-year-old who is about to begin the 10th grade. My concern is when flu season hits, what are the experts' recommendation when it comes to coughing, sneezing, and runny noses? Dr. Torres, your advice? 
And Lester, Thais has a great question. And typically in a flu and cold season, coughs, sneezes, runny nose, those help the virus spread. And so we want to make sure that people cover up and wash their hands plenty of times. The message we usually give out, the difference being that this year, for the past few months, we've been practicing covering up, wearing masks. We've been social distancing, talking about washing our hands and doing that many, many times. And so we think those measures, which are helping keep coronavirus under control, or at least trying to keep it under control, are also going to help keep flu under control. And that's what we're seeing in different parts of the world where the flu has already been, that the, the flu cases seem to be less in number than in a typical year. And again, doing those three measures, wearing masks, washing your hands, watching social distancing are extremely important. But another important point is to make sure you get that flu shot this year, like many experts have talked about. It's important to keep flu under control so we can start working on getting coronavirus under control, Lester. All right, John, thanks. Dr. Redlander, a question from Candria. If occupancy percentages are being enforced indoors at restaurants, should the same science informing that be used for schools, classrooms, indoors? What contrary science allows for schools to safely reopen, but indoor dining to be restricted? Dr. Redlander, how are the two different? Yeah, that's a really great question, Lester. In fact, the two are not different. In fact, I'm even more concerned about children gathering in closed spaces. And I, I, I think we have a lot, a lot of uh, uh, thinking to do about whether we uh, demand or even request that parents consider putting their kids uh, back in the classrooms without the proper protections that we're giving to many other settings where uh, people are gathering. Uh, don't forget, a lot of children are going to be carriers of this uh, coronavirus and will be capable of spreading that virus in classrooms if all of the precautions are not taken. I personally would lean, be leaning towards as much remote learning as possible for those families that can do it. But in the meantime, the question remains very pertinent. Why in restaurants uh, are the rules different than they would be in the classrooms where our children are very, very vulnerable, Lester? We have another question we'd like you to take, Dr. Redletter. It comes from a viewer named Stephanie who writes, my biggest question is kids with special needs. What is going to be available to them if distance learning is implemented? And Dr. Redletter, this is a big issue for a lot of parents who fear their kids are going to fall even further behind. And absolutely, Lester. And a lot of those... Uh a lot of those kids with special needs or even educational needs that uh, go above the average uh, will be struggling if they're not back in the classroom. And what needs to happen here is we need to get a lot more uh, money and funding support from the federal government, from the state government, from the districts to make sure that those children are getting exactly what they need. And this is a great time for parents to really see their role as advocates. And if you feel like your children are not getting what they need and they do have special needs, go to the school go to the superintendent, go to your legislators and demand that these uh, children will get the su extra support that they need no matter what it takes. It's really important and there can be special arrangements made for your children and we need to bend over backwards to make sure that no child is left behind in terms of their education and in particular uh, focus on those kids with uh, more needs than, than the typical child. Dr. Barma, this question came in anonymously. Homeschooling my 13-year-old hasn't been so bad. It's his fear and anxiety that I struggle with. He expects adults to fix all of it. Dr. Barma, what do you say to this parent? You know, I want to say that uh, I think it's so important that we get help and recognize the symptoms of anxiety and depression in young people. Often it might be that they're not sleeping the way that they used to or sleeping too much. Their appetite has changed. Their self-care and their grooming is not there. Their grades are slipping. Their interest in pleasurable activities is not there. So I would say I'm so glad that this parent is recognizing the need for mental health uh, uh, help and to get it. You know, if you're lucky enough to have health insurance, turn the back of the card, call the number, find out about telehealth therapy options. If a guidance counselor is available at school, have the, your, the, the child talk about it and even talk about it at home. You know, what kids are craving and what they lost were those in-person connections. They lost uh, in remote learning structure, support, stimulation, and it's very hard to ask parents to, to, stim to emulate a regular, you know, six to eight hour school day. So I think we need to give compassion and grace to the parents 
and to say that they're doing um, a, a great job. I'm a parent myself, and the homeschooling, I can tell you, it was not easy. Um, and I know that parents are contending with a lot. There's a lot on their plate, but get help for yourself as a parent. All of us need mental health support at this time, 60 to 80 percent. Um, of people are experiencing increased stress, anxiety, depression, and that was already one out of four on a good day. So now with the coronavirus pandemic, we're all experiencing it, and especially young people. So routine, structured stimulation, and mental health support and advice and guidance will go a long way right now. Yeah, it's such an important part of this conversation, Dr. Varma. We're glad you're here, and thanks to the panel. We'll be coming back to you all a bit later in the program, so don't go far. But when we return here, how giving it the old college try is taking on a whole new meaning in the age of COVID-19. Hope you can stay with us. teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. When you need brutal honesty. This isn't about Donald Trump. This is about 400 years of racism. When you need answers first thing in the morning. What needs to be done to make ballots ready to go for the presidential election in November? When you need to go deep inside the story. What's a policy change in policing that you would like to see enacted? And hear from someone who's been there. Who's telling the truth and who's lying every day. That's the news story Americans want to hear. You need your morning Joe only on MSNBC. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America. We are reminded time and time again that we do not. Now I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son. And I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A virus that knows no borders. A real catastrophe happening here in Brazil before our very eyes. Our global fight against it unites us. Here in Mexico City, the people I spoke to said if they don't work, they're not going to be able to feed their families. Our NBC News and Sky teams are on the ground learning from where it's been. The South Korean government is bringing students back over the next couple of weeks in stages. So that you can better understand how it will impact us here. Life across Italy is back to normal. It just doesn't look like the same normal as before. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. These are the United States, a united people with a united purpose. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. All of us can extend a hand to those in need. What do you think needs to be fixed and what would count as justice in this case? Do you have clarity on what the president has actually ordered? I have to ask whether the Democratic Party can turn this around so that this is an engine for progressive political change. People are not six feet apart from one another for the most part. Are you worried that these two crises may dovetail in terms of the risk of transmission at these ongoing protests? some 20 million college students in this country and it is safe to say that every one of them is wondering tonight what the coming semester holds will they be attending classes in person or online will campuses be open and if so will they be safe nbc's rahema ellis has taken a closer look it just might be the toughest college course in history that is charting a safe course to bring students back to campus while some schools are going entirely online, many campuses have spent this summer grappling with the enormous task of safely hosting thousands of young adults and decided they're going to give it the old college try. Case in point, 
Michigan State University in East Lansing. A lot of it's based on really um, applying what we know about coronavirus. MSU's president, Dr. Samuel Stanley, is an expert in infectious diseases. The question on every parent's mind is how will you keep students safe on campus? And, and that's absolutely the right question to be asking. And I think it's one that we've thought a tremendous amount about uh, as we prepare to open our, for our classes on September 2nd. The countdown to that collegiate D-Day is on. Dr. Stanley and Michigan State administrators invited us inside one of their virtual war room meetings as they made decisions on the best way to bring students back safely. Um, we're in the process of processing um, the live at home application. The vice provost is getting messages out to the students. Um, our impact radio station is producing a number of public service announcements. And the provost updated the faculty online. plan. 35 percent uh, will be in person and 15 percent uh, as of now are a hybrid. There would normally be 15,000 students living on campus. This year it will be more like 11,000. But even with fewer students, officials know how tough it will be to pull this off. We have sleepless nights every day. COVID tests will be given if a student develops symptoms and then... Just having them either quarantine or isolate depending on whether they're positive or they've been exposed. Most courses here will be online, but the university says students should have the experiences only being on campus can bring. That said, anything can happen. The key word for all of us in higher education is pivot. We have to be ready to pivot because we don't know enough about this virus. We don't know enough about the potential impact. In fact, the university community has already seen what could go wrong. In June, a popular East Lansing bar, Harper's Brew Pub, reopened. Everyone was dancing around. There was no social distance. No one was wearing masks. Turns out, Harper's became ground zero for a super spreader event that led to nearly 200 COVID infections. No one was hospitalized, but it was a very close call. How are you in the world are you going to control this behavior when you and other administrators at the campus and at the university are not watching? And again, that's a challenge and, and I won't minimize it. I think part of it is having that conversation with your student and helping them, your son or daughter, helping them understand um, what's required of them that they go to Michigan State. It means no large gatherings, period. Wearing a mask is mandatory, and students must agree to a new set of rules. And then you as a parent, if you're not comfortable that this is a way that your student can be safe, then I've encouraged people to study remotely. MSU's student government president says she's confident her classmates will pull together to protect one another. Our ability to hold each other accountable. Students have proven that so many times over and over again. Dining halls, dormitories and classrooms have been redesigned and everyone will be monitored. Michigan State developed an early warning system using wastewater. When all those cases occurred at the local bar... Well, lo and behold, we found a very large peak of the virus in the sewage at the same time that the Harper's outbreak started taking place. So we do believe that now we've got um, evidence and we can set up a system for early warning. But as the administration has been finding out, being ready for anything is the name of the game. Just days ago, Michigan State's athletic director was gearing up for the start of the football season. So we're, we're excited for the fall. Uh, a fair bit of trepidation, um, but, uh, but cautiously optimistic. Then on Tuesday, the Big Ten decided to postpone all sports, including football, until at least spring. It's the type of last minute change the university knows it will have to deal with all semester. For now, the hope is that all the students scheduled to come back will still be here when the snow begins to fly, but... After all this is said and done, if there is an outbreak, would you be willing to just pull the plug on on campus learning? Absolutely. Absolutely. If we feel as though every modality we've put in place are not adequate in keeping students, faculty or staff safe, um, then yes, absolutely. We would go to fully remote if we need to do that. That was NBC's Rahima Ellis reporting. We'll be back with more in a moment, including some words of wisdom from some of the kids in the middle of all this. And we're going to hear more from our panel of experts on just what those kids are up against when we continue with coronavirus and the classroom.
on the father trying to teach his son about peace. We don't have to retaliate with anger. We retaliate with love. That's why we're down here. There's always another way. So that's all I want him to see. When you need brutal honesty. This isn't about Donald Trump. This is about 400 years of racism. When you need answers first thing in the morning. What needs to be done to make ballots ready to go for the presidential election in November? When you need to go deep inside the story. What's a policy change in policing that you would like to see enacted? And hear from someone who's been there. Who's telling the truth and who's lying every day. That's the news story Americans want to hear. You need your morning Joe only on MSNBC. We'd like to think that we live in some sort of post-racial America. We are reminded time and time again that we do not. Now I reached out to you after I watched the mayor of Atlanta act as a mom trying to raise her son. And I think about you and your kids. I remember her coming home saying, why don't I have a ponytail like the white girls? It's okay to notice that you're different. You just have to not feel less than. That's my thing. I cherish the fact that we can have these discussions. I feel safe talking about this with you guys. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. A virus that knows no borders. A real catastrophe happening here in Brazil before our very eyes. Our global fight against it unites us. Here in Mexico City, the people I spoke to said if they don't work, they're not going to be able to feed their families. Our NBC News and Sky teams are on the ground learning from where it's been. The South Korean government is bringing students back over the next couple of weeks in stages. So that you can better understand how it will impact us here. Life across Italy is back to normal. It just doesn't look like the same normal as before. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. These are the United States, a united people with a united purpose. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. All of us can extend a hand to those in need. What do you think needs to be fixed and what would count as justice in this case? Do you have clarity on what the president has actually ordered? I have to ask whether the Democratic Party can turn this around so that this is an engine for progressive political change. People are not six feet apart from one another for the most part. Are you worried that these two crises may dovetail in terms of the risk of transmission at these ongoing protests? Watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. This is the time of year when going back to school weighs heavy on the minds of most kids. But clearly these are no ordinary times. So we talked to some of those students about it and asked them with their parents' permission what learning in the time of COVID has been like for them. If I was a teacher and had to give coronavirus a grade, I would say... I'd give it a B plus. The C. What? If I was a teacher, I would give coronavirus a F. 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 F with a million minuses. I'll just expel it. In March when my school was closing down, I, I thought it was going to be fun. Because all we had to do was go on virtual with our class and then do our homework. And then after like a few weeks of virtual school, uh, the virtual school again. The one thing I miss most of being in school is being able to see my teachers and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And I didn't really have a good computer to do work with, so I would be laggy. It definitely was very, very weird to have my bedroom as my school room. I lay on my bed a lot, so I get distracted way, like, I get distracted easily. <laughs> I think that sometimes seeing people on Zoom, it doesn't feel like they're real people. When you ask a question, sometimes they don't hear you, or sometimes they can't see you, raise your hand. If you want to learn anything from your math class this year, you have to, and I had to, learn a lot of it on your own, honestly. I would like to see that they come up with a vaccine, so this could all just be over like a bad nightmare. 
miss my friends a lot, building up these relationships with these great people just doing so many things, and I feel like it's just being torn down. It just goes to show that anything can change our lives entirely from one little event that happened. Let's turn once again to our panel and questions from our younger viewers. Before we get to those prepared questions, Dr. Varma, if I could ask you, we think of parents as the ones that parents and the adults make the health and safety decisions regarding kids, but how important is it to include children and young people in these conversations? Thank you so much for asking that because I have two little young ones at home and I'm really trying to include them into the fold because you know, as a parent, so much we're used to being in the driver's seat. And then it's interesting that you might have a conversation with a partner or a friend and your kids overhear you and they're like, hey, I'm over here. What about me? Do I get a say in the matter? Um, and so I think it's really important to incorporate where they're coming from and have age appropriate conversations. Because if you're talking about somebody who's above the age of six or seven, they know what's going on. They're watching television. They're, ha they're listening to your conversations or overhearing and they have an opinion. And we see anxiety in young children and they start to regress if they've ha achieved certain milestones. For example, if they're toilet trained, they might start bedwetting. So they might have more clingy behavior, more anxious behavior. So as a parent, it's really important to say, hey, what's going on? Tell me about this. Uh, are you feeling more anxious? Are you worried? What are you worried about? Are you worried about me getting sick? Are you worried about you getting sick? Are your teachers getting sick? Or gr grandpa getting sick because you might catch something? So I love that question and thank you for asking because we don't involve our kids enough and we absolutely need to because there's a whole idea of parent guilt, you know, mom guilt. We feel it all the time anyway at baseline. And now when, you know, we have to deal with uh, the pandemic and making hard decisions. So include them in the fold well, and you might feel reassured by it. Yeah, and we're gonna include them right now because we've got some of their questions. I'm gonna start with Dr. Torres. This comes from a seven-year-old, Layla, who asks, why do I have to wear a mask if we're six feet apart, Doc? And Lester, I think a lot of us have Layla's exact question. When do I have to wear a mask and when don't I necessarily need to put it on? Now, if you can guarantee that six foot distance, then you might not need a mask, but it's really hard to guarantee. And we know the things that actually work to help protect us and other people around us are the three W's. Wear a mask, watch your distance, that six foot distance, and wash your hands. Those three things work. But like I said, if you're out in public, you might not be able to keep that six foot distance. And as a matter of fact, a study found also out of Italy that if you do wear a mask, then people are more likely to stay six feet away from you because they see that mask on and they know you want to be safe, Lester. Yeah. Dr. Varma, Terry says, my college sorority wants to open in September and bring in 34 girls to live in a congregate housing facility for room and board. How can they socially distance? What happens if one person tests positive? Would all the girls have to be quarantined for 14 days? What are your thoughts? And um, Lester, while I definitely respect the role of um, fraternities and sororities um, for building community, I do think that 34 is a large number of people to put in one house. I know that a lot of colleges don't want to have even classes, which might only be one or two hours, not even a full living situation, more than 30 people. So a lot of places are limiting the number of uh, students per uh, Greek house. And they're also saying that rooms should be dedicated for quarantine rooms, whether it be in the house or off campus. And if we want to facilitate community, and if that is the purpose of this, then let's do as much of that community um, online remotely if possible. But I do get that right. loneliness is a big epidemic in this country, and we want to be careful of that. All right. Dr. Redletter, Sanjay asks, should we start wearing glasses to protect our eyes from the virus? And my second question is, which is better, goggles or glasses? So Lester, also a good question, and, and theoretically you can catch the uh, virus through your eyes, through the mucous membranes in your eyes, and wearing glasses would probably be okay, and goggles uh, would be most protective, but really we think those uh, types of uh, devices should be reserved for people in very close contact with potential patients, for example, uh, healthcare workers or uh, people working in beauty salons or barber shops where there's a lot of direct contact. We're going to see soon also uh, people work in on airplanes and flight crews and so on who are with people all day long in uh, closed uh, spaces. They might be wearing uh, uh, eye protection and goggles are better than glasses. Glasses better than nothing. But I think for the general public, we're not ready to recommend, in fact, that, uh, that the general public start wearing goggles at this point, Lester. All right. 
Well, we're out of time, but we want to thank our panel and all those who participated tonight, helping us understand and cope with one of the biggest challenges this country has ever faced. Closing America's schools as this pandemic took hold some five months ago was hard, but reopening them is proving to be much harder. And as we've seen tonight, it's going to take all of us working together to get it right. From Battery Park City in New York, I'm Lester Holt. For all of us at NBC News, thank you for joining us tonight. Good night.